His Holiness Mahanaguru Dr. Kumar Swami Tampiran of Dharma Yadina, President, Secretary, Coordinator, and other respectable members of the Seminary Mantra, respected great person who have assembled here, ladies and gentlemen. My humble salutations to all of you. Indeed, I deem it a great honor bestowed by Sydney Muruhan through the organizers of this great event. This is a wonderful event, as I have explained today, through which we are going to reap five important benefits. And the chief among them is the human love, universal love, which is the main spirit of Saivism. The topic is the ancient Saivism as a spiritual movement. Let me explain first the meaning of Saivism. What do you mean by Saivam or Saivism? It is a perfect system of a perfect human society meant for realization of Shiva and the attainment of Shiva. I repeat, this is a perfect system of a perfect human society meant for the realizing Shiva within himself and the attainment of Shiva. And then the question switch over to what is meant by Shiva. In our scriptures, the term Shiva has been defined in 22 different ways. The, the name Shiva has got 22 shades of meaning. And I select three meanings here. The utmost purity, goodness, and universal love. The Shiva, the term Shiva has got all these meanings. The human society is expected to maintain utmost purity in word and deeds. Utmost goodness and it has to express universal compassion or universal love. This is the meaning given in the scriptures. And then how old it is? The antiquity of Saivism cannot be measured or estimated in terms of years. I quote the scintillating words of Gurudeva Shivaya Subramanya Swami in one of his articles of Triology, he says, there has never been a time in this world in which Saivism has not existed. There was never a time in this world in which Saivism has not existed in the world. The second, Saivism has been existing in this world right from the beginning of mankind. These are the two statements he was repeatedly writing in his articles. Gurudeva was the chosen disciple of Sivayoga Swami and he was with the full, fullness of enlightenment and universal love. So his words are trustworthy, authentic and indisputable. When he says like this, are there any clues, are there any evidences to establish such antiquity? Yes, there are. The Vedas and the Agamas are the basic subjects for Saivism. 
How old are these agamas? We are able to deduce that these agamas are at least, it goes back to 16,000 BC. Not 600 or 10,000, 10, 600 or 10,000, it goes back to 16,000 BC. Such old scriptures we do have. How this date has been determined? In many Agamas, we have references to the rising and setting of a particular important Natchatra or star. And the name of that star is Agastya Natchatra. In modern astronomical science, it is called Canopus. The rising and setting of this Canopus star has been frequently mentioned in many Agamas for determining the auspicious time for many events. The rising and setting of such a chitra has gone out of phenomenon just 16,000 years before. Now it has turned as a South Pole star, which we cannot see. We are not able to see the rising and setting of Agastya Chitra. But the Agamas have got many references, have mentioned in several times such rising and setting. So we are naturally led to conclude that Agamas have such an antiquity. These are uh, at least go back to 16,000 BC. Besides that, there are so many astronomical evidences, just like the uh, non setting of a parade group of stars and such as astronomical happenings which all go to prove the antiquity of the Saivagamas and the Vedas. Uh, with the short notes on antiquity, uh, let me attest to the central theme of Saivism that is universal compassion, the spiritual movement it is mainly a spiritual movement. Our scriptures classify the souls in, into six kinds. The soul endowed with one faculty of knowing. Souls with two faculties of knowing. Souls with three faculties, four, five. One faculty of knowing means to realize the sound. Two faculty to realize sound and touch. Three faculties to realize sound, touch and form. Four faculties to realize sound, touch, form and taste. Five faculties to realize sound, touch, form, taste and smell. These, there are different kinds of souls. For example, ant. It can smell, <coughs> it can hear. The trees and plants are able to realize the touch. Likewise, they are, these are the gradations of the soul. And finally, what the Agama was saying, the souls endowed with six faculties of knowing and the sixth one is the power of discrimination to know what is bad and what is good, what is to be done, what, what is to be avoided. This is a special faculty given for human being. Having said so, what does it say? It is a duty of human being to take care of all other beings. Being endowed with discriminative power, he should be compassionate. to all other beings right from the single faculty to five faculty. He should not hurt Ahimsa. Swami was referring to Jiva Gaurundiya. This is the main spirit of Saivism. Raising and developing this thought, our scriptures emphasizes that human beings should be mutually helping, mutually guiding, 
and every human being is expected to express his unconditional love. It does not advocate an isolated life. Man should live in a perfect society. There is an interesting episode in the Yogapada of the Agamas. I am glad to say that for the first time I am exposing this episode. I was expecting for a good opportunity to tell this and fortunately it has that opportunity has come. It is a very nice episode. A saintly person who has uh, led his life purely, unconsciously, was elevated higher and higher. And finally he approaches Shiva Loka, the world of Shiva. When he was about to cross the main gate, the doorkeepers upset at him, stopped him. Please do not enter. You are not allowed. You are stopped there. The saint was taken aback. What wrong has, has I committed? I have led a pure life. So what is the meaning of being upset here? He asked, why are you upset me? You me? Know, it is order from the higher officials. I am not supposed to allow you. When he was arguing with the main doorkeepers, the persons whom he had discarded in his early life, who had disregard, disregard for them, were entering one by one, right in front of his face. He was again annoyed by this. What is the people whom I have disregarded, they are entering, they are not upsetted, but I am upsetted. Now what is the reason behind it? Then he asked. The gatekeeper slowly asked three questions one by one. How many disciples you have instructed, you have enlightened? How many disciples? He thought, no, I was alone. I didn't have any disciple. Second, With how many people you have shared your knowledge? The second question. Have you shared your knowledge to anybody, any fellow being? No, I didn't share. I was alone. The third question. How many people you have helped? He thought about No, I didn't help anybody. I was alone. Then you keep alone here. That's why, that's why we are upsetting. Since you yourself kept alone all through your life, without guiding anybody, without enlightening anybody, without sharing your Lord, what is your use of your life? You have come all the way. Since there was no soul, you have been defined and given guidelines Simply because of this notion, the mutual help, mutual guidance, and universal love. This is the spirit of main spirit of Saivism. <clears throat> and even the worshipful events which are taking place inside the main shrine, the benefits of such worship reach all the beings. Yes. In Svacharyas, upon the completion of the worship, he says, Sarve Jana Sukhino Bhavantu. Jana means, the, it don't, does not mean the human beings, all the living beings. At the completion of the ritual, he prays, let all beings of the world be happy, be content, be comfortable. This is the main spirit of Saivism. And with these few words, once again, thanking all the dignitaries and organizers for having given me a good chance 
Thank you for listening to these words. Pana. Respected and revered Swamiji's president, respected leaders of the community, respected elders, beloved brothers and sisters. The subject that I have been asked to speak is love is God. Love is God. So, how do we do this? And coming from a scientific background, being a professor of a university after 20 years of research, the whole science of the religion can be explained in so specific terms that you cannot but accept that the approach is extremely scientific. Love is God. For to, for, to achieve this, you need to know what is the difference between man's love and God's love. Because if you know the difference, then the man's love can may be made to be evolved towards embracing God's love. Man's love, and also woman's love, man's love is <laughs> basically is that it is very conditional. Everything that we do in this world is conditional love, which means to say that there are certain conditions in for me to manifest my love. Example, in the workplace, if you are promoted, I'm inspired. But if despite all my work, if I'm now sidelined, I become dejected, I become rejected, and I start looking for new jobs for me to apply for because I'm extremely disappointed. In the same way, even if you take it as a human relationship is concerned, even between husband and wife is extremely conditional. But when you come to God's love, the term that is used is that it is unconditional love. When we make our love more and more unconditional, our love becomes extremely divine. And therefore, the ability to make our love unconditional is the way towards walking to God's path. How do you make that unconditional? Meaning, we must have God's mercy. We must have the ability to forget and forgive. In fact, we always forget to forgive. Actually, by right, we should forgive and forget. <laughs> Very often, many people keep us so many things in their heart that has happened 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Once I said to one elderly man and said, and he said, uh, Suresh, this is all philosophy. It is very good. But what he has done to me, I will never forget. You know, he said. So that time, and you know, before I came here, what he has done, I will never forget. So I said, uh, and he said, maybe time will heal. So now I said, Uncle, you're already 85 years old. How much time do you need to forget? <laughs> so the point of the story is that we need to know how to quickly forgive and how to quickly forget. That can only be done if we are more and more associated with God consciousness. Give you a good example. If you just see the picture behind Swamiji, you will see the dancing Shiva. Can you see? That's a dancing Shiva. Now, that is called Nataraja. Now, there in the philosophy, it is said that the Lord dances in the Himalayan mountains. And therefore, when you're in Kailas, so when you go and speak to people, especially youth, they will say, what does this mean? <laughs> if you go to Kailas, will we be able to see Lord Shiva dancing? No, no, Lord Shiva is there, but you, know, you, know, you see, we never asked this question to our elders. We just totally believed everything what they said. And today, the younger mind is now questioning. What kind of a symbol is that? If you say that this is the dancing Shiva, where is he dancing? That is the question that the young minds, science has trained them to ask. Our great rishis, yogis, and all the people who saw the wisdom captured the entire science in the form of the dance. In the book called uh, Toh of Physics, Fritz Kapara writes in the preface, where he was sailing in the boat, and there he saw a vision of all the molecules dancing in space. In Newton's theory, the smallest particle is an atom. And for many, many years, atom was supposed to be the smallest particle. It was only later the uncertainty principle, Heisenberg uncertainty principle came out. And it is here that said that exact position and momentum of any particle cannot be located at any one point of time. It is during using Schrodinger's uh, equation and Einstein's theory, they saw they could split up the atom into energy packets, which meant that everything in this world is energy. Everything even in this table is an energy. So all that we see is really energy. 
and to demonstrate that it is energy, the great masters conceptualized the form of the Lord and to demonstrate that the dancing Shiva is actually the dancing atoms and ions that is now circulating in this world. And if these were to stop, the world will stop philosophically. That is how the stories are written. The dance must continue and it is true. Right now in our human body, there are not six million, not six billion, but six trillion activities taking place in our body. There is no computer or laptop that actually can calculate the number of permutations and combinations of all the cells, the biochemical activities, the physiological activities, the DNA, are all those things that are taking place in this body. At this point of time, when I'm speaking to you, six trillion activities are going on. Not, you did not tell your heart to pump 21,000 21, times today. The heart will continue to pump. If it stops, you will not know, others will know. <laughs> and we'll be quick to chant the Triyamaga Mandra. Therefore, therefore, the point is, the heart is pumping, the cells are doing. What is that intelligence that governs this whole movement of cellular structures and bodily, bodily functions? This, in science, they don't say Shiva, but they use a term, they call it the universal intelligence. So the universal intelligence, hailed by different religions, can call that by different names. It's just name. But the universal intelligence, in this context, we say it is Lord Shiva. So therefore, the, how the beauty of science has been envisioned by the scientists and captured by a symbol to demonstrate to the common mind that this is what the whole science is all about. Like this, if you strip every aspect of the religion and tradition, there are deeper imports of uh, elements of science in it. Likewise, our whole problem in life is love. WHO, the World Health Organization, says that the greatest disease, the biggest disease that will come in the future may not be Ebola virus, but it will be depression. Can you imagine depression? In, in New Zealand, uh, there are 550 youth who dies every year of suicide. Suicide is becoming a huge problem in many developed countries. And why are they killing themselves? Lack of love. Not able to see where love is coming from. Why are divorces increasing? It is because of extreme lack of love and sharing and compromising in situations. Why is it that children are running away from parents and doing things like that? Lack of love. Why is society collapsing? It's because of lack of love. So whatever said and done, this seems to be the eternal solution for all perennial problems, for all societies of mankind, that love must be the central focus. Without love, there is no cement. <laughs> Today the children come back at 2 a.m. 2 a.m., 3 a.m. And parents are so scared to ask them also, why have you come so late? Because the children reply, Vandu to me. Allah Vandu to me. So they're very scared to ask why they have come late. Where have you been? What have you been doing? All that is not supposed to be said. Therefore, the, the disciplining of the minds have become very, very low. Now let me tell you another great secret for parents here. In the name of love, children sit in front of the television. Young children, babies, they, they watch Tom and Jerry cartoons. They watch all these things and you say it's okay, they are cartoons. But we don't understand. Every incident in Tom and Jerry cartoons are violent scenes. So from very young itself, thousands of implosions of violence have gone into their mind. In which is why today people, they watch movies which are more of the action oriented movies. Not the subtle love story, they'll say, you're so boring, what's so dull? Because they don't have the capacity to appreciate these things. The mind has become so vigorous and so, so volatile that they become so vulnerable that easily they get attached and fast they dissipate their enthusiasm and the energy. And hence, the youth today do not have sufficient strength, no ability to endure. This is the thing. No ability to endure. Even a slight scolding, they become very, very affected. Not like before. So therefore, the quality slowly has decreased. No doubt they can be very fast. They can have lots of information because the information age has given them so much of uh, advantage in terms of acquiring knowledge. <laughs> but in terms of applying the knowledge in terms of seeing things in a larger context that can only come when you have extreme sense of love 
So when love moves from being conditioned, it becomes moves from being restricted and comes into areas in which you are able to see, embrace it, appreciate. So when children now can devote their love and say to the parents, whatever happens, I will look after you till the end. That is love. When you marry uh, someone and you say to that person that till you die, I will be there for you and I will protect you as the eyelid that protects the eye. It's very romantic, but there you are. That's the truth and that is love. We, we work in some place, despite what salary you give me and how you treat me, I will give you my best into this organization. That's love. Despite the fact that I've come from different parts of the world, but I'm here settled in Australia, I will make sure that as a result of my inspiration for my Saivite religion, I will contribute to this country because this country has also given me livelihood and make, devoting my life to make this country a place for heaven and relating myself regardless of race and religion is a demonstration of unconditional love exposed and expounded by the Saivite religion. This is what the whole quality of the love. And to make that quality more, become more refined, you come to the gym. In our place, this gym is called temple. So you come here and you do the mental gymnastics. You pray, you prostrate, you throw the flower, you put the flower, you show the camphor, whatever said and done, you bring all your problems of the conditioned world and be inspired from the unconditional love that the Lord gives so that we can go back and serve society and mankind unconditionally. So that finally when we leave the body and reach the other loga, gods will be there to embrace us. And like what the master teacher has said just now, that he will be able to receive us because we shared our love with so many people. Hence, our entire task of this conference is to find a renewed energy, a vigorous energy to reignite our entire ideals and serve the world, serve our children, serve our parents and become a most exemplary role model society for that we can trigger the same example in all other communities. That is what the whole ideals of becoming a religion is. It is no point become, coming to a religion and remaining the same as one who doesn't have it. The one who has religious knowledge and wisdom must become more productive, more energetic and more loving because God is love. Thank you so much.